Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Beat the Big Guys. I'm your host, Sandy Rosenthal. And my guest today is from the great state of California, more specifically, the San Francisco Davis area. And her name is Celia Lobono Gonzalez. Hey, Celia. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. Now, I forgot to, to talk to you about pronunciation of your name before we started. Did I do it right? You did great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My name, another way to say it too is Celia Lobono Gonzalez, but, but you did great. <laughs> I, I go right. by a lot of different pronunciations. All good. <laughs> I One of my biggest regrets is not taking Spanish in high school. It is such a beautiful language, and it would be so very useful in the year 2024. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there, but, there's many languages. I wish I had taken something other than Spanish because I already knew Spanish. <laughs> well, there you yeah. go. There you go. And and as people are quick to tell me, Sandy, you know, you can still learn a language. And I know that, I know that. And so um, I, it, 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 it is the language I want to learn. I'm tired of, of asking other people, what did they just say? You know, I, I'd like to be able to, I like to do things for myself. So as of today, I'm going to make it an effort. I'm going to learn Spanish, especially since you run into someone every day that speaks it. <laughs> true. And it's good for our brain. It keeps us. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> That's another reason it's good. So, well, that, well, thanks you for that pep talk. <laughs> and um, I'm going to go ahead, since, since our listeners aren't familiar with you as I am, I'm going to go ahead and give them a, a little introduction, okay? Okay. Okay, Celia, say your name for us again. <laughs> Celia Lobono Gonzalez. Oh, she sounds so. That's another reason right there to learn Spanish, you know, to get the accent right. So it's a uh, Celia, or as we we um, uh, um, people that don't know the language say, Celia is. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful name both ways. Celia is a worker owner of Other Avenues Grocery Cooperative in the Outer Sunset Boulevard. Excuse me, the Outer Sunset neighborhood of San Francisco. Born and raised in San Francisco and Davis, California, she is a food sovereignty organizer and spirit weaver with over a decade of experience in local and global grassroots campaigns opposing genetic engineering and corporate consolidation in food and agriculture. Now, I haven't been doing that for 10 years, but I'm all for both of those. Celia is committed to being in service of agroecology and indigenous land back stewardship. Well, I'm part, I, I am for sure want to know a whole lot more about your work and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I, um, as mentioned, I'm really interested in food systems and I got involved in in food system organizing um, in 2013, um, a little bit after getting to college and connecting with what was happening at the time, um, the March Against Monsanto, and looking at how um, pesticides and war companies producing pesticides um, have infiltrated our food system and, you know, uh, basically forced us to to accept uh, the poisoning of our bodies and the land. And um, so working through grassroots, um, you know, campaigns, um, volunteering um, to educate people about our food systems, learn more about our food systems and um, traditional food systems. And that um, led me also to work in, in college and trying to look at food systems at San Francisco State, um, trying to make sure we had what we were calling um, you know, real food, um, humane, local, fair trade, ecological. Um, and um, leaving college, um, you know, I was looking for a food system job and in my neighborhood, um, was other avenues, which um, was great because mm -hmm. I was starting to learn about uh, food co-ops, cooperative labor work, so worker-owned um, food co-ops in, in 
particular and um, and other avenues as worker owned. So um, and the history of other avenues is amazing and continues to inspire me um, and continues to be revealed also. Um, you know, it started officially in 1974, um, uh, but even preceding that, there were amazing rooted movements in the Bay Area um, trying to establish access to nourishing food in the same vein of, you know, looking at, um, you know, um, anti-war movements and looking at how food um, was, you know, becoming more poisoned um, and how they could distribute organic food to communities that needed it and wanted it. And um, that was known as the food conspiracy um, in the 60s, which later led to, we can talk more about the people's food system um, becoming a, a connection of, of different food system, um, cooperative food entities like other avenues, which is where we were born and other food warehouses, um, chef buying clubs, and a whole network in the Bay Area of, um, of, of brick and mortar, I should say, um, food co-ops that were working together to, to talk about food systems in the Bay Area and how to improve um, people's lives around them. Um, and yeah, since then, Other Avenues has had its doors open, um, serving community uh, organic food in the community in the outer sunset of San Francisco. Um, and, and it's been, it's been really fun. It's been really beautiful. I've been there for, um, for five years. It's been tough. We went through a pandemic and, you know, working through, uh, a lot of different, um, you know, pieces of the business and how to look at like our strengths and our weaknesses and working through, you know, all kinds of different people, uh, uh, uh new and, you know, a new collective every time we get a new person, um, and that's that's where we are today, in 2024, continuing the work. Well, congratulations. That's really exciting. And uh, there's, there's a couple of things I had no idea uh, that, that you touched on and in, in, in just the little bit that, that you spoke. So I really wasn't aware that there was um, attention was being paid and pushback had begun on the, the food food uh, conglomerates, for lack of a better word, to just p to pick something, as far back as, as the 1930s. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And and worker and, um, you know, food systems, as well as uh, cooperatives, worker cooperatives um, in San Francisco have mm -hmm. a lot of history as well, you know, with um, seamstresses and like work shoe boot um uh, worker collectives forming sometimes, you know, from union strikes that failed and being like, whatever, we're going to just start our own company. So there's actually a lot of history here in San Francisco um, of cooperative labor. I, I, I really had no idea. And I, I think that's great um, because, it, and yeah, in my mind, it was really a, of a more recent thing that the pushback and saying, just saying no. And speaking of the pushback, it's so often the big business, big companies, no matter what they are, who they are, they they believe that they're just going to force people to accept their way, my way or the highway. And they're shocked when somebody says no. They're usually right. shocked and they usually don't know how to handle it. And if right. they, and if they, and, so therefore the power we have just by saying, no, no, I'm not going to take your, um, there's only two choices of tomatoes. When, when we all know there's 50 types of tomatoes, just to pick one example, uh, but it's up to the customer to just say no. Um, and I, this is your your presentation, not mine, but a great example is fish. Okay, we go to the fish market here in America, and we we get not that many varieties of fish, and they're often not that fresh. Japan, what a difference. First of all, there's so many different kinds of fish, and they're fresh, 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 fresh. You don't see a day-old fish because no one in Japan will buy it. My point is, you all you have to do is say no. Nope, not not going to buy your 
your um, unfresh fish. So anyway, I didn't mean to change the subject at all. No, I'm talking absolutely. about I mean, you have. My family's mm. family Spanish and my mom has complained my entire life about how there is very poor fish um, selection here. So I know that story very well. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'll say it's not just about saying no. It's also about asking for more because I think um, sometimes in, you know, in, in grocery stores, people are trying to, um, you know, find what the customer wants, want to stay financially sound, make sure you're selling things people want. But, um, but so that's why it's important as a customer as well to, to push, um, you know, the buyers and stores and ask for a diversity of products. So people will be more open to bringing things in and at other avenues we have, um, like these customer request forms that we get really excited about when people ask us like to bring in a particular product, um, which really also helps inform us as, uh, as buyers and what, and what people want to see. And we try out a bunch of new things that maybe on our own, we might not have, you know, come across. Um, and that also adds to, you know, the diversity of the food, the foodscape. Um, so, it's, it's yeah, it's important opposite. to keep on that of the usual model these companies use is they create a product product that they decide we need and then convince us that we need it. So this is turning that on its head, allowing exactly. them to decide what they need and, and looking at, at it from there. But, but yeah, it, it, you're right. It is more than just saying no, it's a, you know, a, a offering other alternatives and, uh, and then, you know, one wonderful things can happen and are happening the but but again the the these these big guys whoever they are are usually shocked when someone actually stands up and says no i'm not going to accept things the way they are i'm not going to accept the things the way you're presenting them to me and sometimes actually they usually have you know a, a kind of sort of a plan already written and ready to go but they're often really wrong <laughs> about it and 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 the one yeah. of the favorite thing about the big guys is they make huge mistakes. But anyway, what were you going to say? Oh, I just made me think of, um, you know, when I was organizing um, the March Against Monsanto, you know, there was also a lot of um, one of the centerpieces, right, was rejecting genetically engineered um, food in agriculture. <laughs> and um, and so what kind of got big, right, was aside from, um, you know, demanding organics, I think people started to learn a little bit more about GMOs. And I, I do think that I saw a big um, trans transition towards a lot more brands, particularly in the natural food sector, but even beyond that, um, you know, going and getting the, the certification to be non-GMO. Um, of course, organic is uh, one step farther and really that is um kind of an ultimate goal um even beyond organic but um uh, but I did see people learning and demanding changes and and companies and brands you know catering to that um for better or for worse perhaps um you know because there's still a lot of uh lack of transparency with with food and labeling um but it, it you know things things could change <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, the, the citizen at large, it's just remarkable. And what about the power of the, the citizen at large or the buyer just to say, well, I'm not going to buy your brand. I'm going to switch brands. Um, do, do you think that's a, a good tool, a valuable tool to say, I'm not going to purchase from you? Yeah, and I think it's important to also be vocal about why um, okay. so that people understand why you're making your choice and you can influence other people to do the same. Okay. Um, you know, um, as a buyer, we'll do the same too. You know, like I, I've tried to comb through and get rid of a lot of different brands that, you know, started off as like family owned, you know, natural organic companies, but later on sold out or got purchased by a bigger company, um, potentially as big as like Nestle or, you know, Kraft and all these other um, larger corporations that, um, have actually invested in stopping uh, progressive legislation to provide more transparency and labeling in in into the food system. So, 
um, that is something that I've tried to comb through. It's tough though, um, because a lot of the times they own a lot of different brands that people are familiar with. So, um, so when we do those changes, we say we're, we're getting rid of this, this product and we know you really like it. Um, we do our best to find an alternative and also educate people about like, Hey, did you know this brand was purchased by, you know, by Nestle? We're not, we're not interested. Um, and, and usually people respond really well and they're like, wow, thank you. I didn't know. I hate Nestle. <laughs> um, yeah, they'll say, thank you for telling me. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that to my attention because we can't be experts at everything. Right. The, yeah, uh, so it's the it, there's a term that I was just recently been brought to my attention uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with it uh, where companies earn a status uh, in terms of you know, the way they do business and in, in terms of their footprint um, and their carbon footprint and, and and helping. And there's an actual term. I know Patagonia is one of those companies. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Are you talking about like the B Corps? Or yes, or yes, B Corp. B Corp. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Uh, and and because I had yeah. never heard the term and I'm... I, I didn't think I was a, an idiot, but, but that I felt like I was when I heard the term for the first time. So maybe you can talk a little bit to our listeners about B Corps and, and the, the value. I mean, B Corp stands for Benefit Corporation, right? So, and I don't know too much about the details of it all, but from what I understand, you know, they're structured in a way where um, it's not just the classic capitalist extract shareholder profit like we exist um with a mission to make profit for our shareholders period um and anything that doesn't do that you know you know is not us but so b corp establishes a little bit more of like a social purpose in what the goals of the organization are and in connection with its bottom line so uh i don't know exactly i, I want I, i'm curious to learn more if there's different ways of structuring that and how you know profits are um distributed um but you know i will also say that and and i think it's important especially for big bigger companies to to look at um those kind of options it's also it there's also you know even other older structures that exist like cooperatives that are inherently already structured, um, you know, with the distribution of wealth in mind. And so, um, I mean, even consumer-owned co-ops, um, you know, are retaining the wealth in the community, worker-owned or worker-owned co-ops even more so because um, the wealth is not being extracted to, you know, these shareholders, which could be in another country or, in, you know, just hoarding all the wealth already of all the corporate interests that they, they have. Um, but rather the profits are being, um, you know, distributed to the workers themselves, which um, has another uh, exponential impact um, because that, uh, though the, that wealth, I should say, then is spent by the worker in the community that they live in, right? The, so the, the wealth generation stays local rather than being extracted. Um, and so that has kind of another net benefit right for how um communities and local ecosystems can share and maintain maintain themselves that was a fabulous answer and so they are you know what's the right word like they organically already are b corps they're already meeting a lot of the definitions yeah. Of, of a B Corp. And then I, I hate to say that I am just as suspicious as, as the next person that anything can be abused. And even though a, 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 like a privilege or a symbol or a stamp of approval can be abused. And even, even, um, uh, even though it's my understanding that it's very difficult to get um, a staff to get that um, uh, designation to be a B Corp and difficult to keep it. I still hate to say I, I can't help but wonder, is it being abused? No, no. who's really right. watching? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a huge problem with regulation, lack of regulation um, in this mm -hmm. country, in California, in, in agriculture, you know, it's bad. I mean, Another going back to the, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. You know, I try to do my best to track all the different certifications that come out and there's a lot of interesting ones, you know, um, 
but it's a lot for the consumer to keep up with, you know, and even in USDA organic, you know, that um, is actually quantified differently based off the third party certifier. So um, depending who's actually certifying that mm -hmm. it's organic, some, some have higher standards and some have really poor, just baseline organic standards. Um, you know, or Oregon Tilth and um, CCOF, um, they are some of the highest organic standards, but there's others that a lot of companies you know, opt for and um, it's not the same standards. So there's a lot, there's a lot <laughs> to keep up with. <laughs> Right. And, and we hope we like to believe someone's paying attention, but there's probably not enough people paying attention. But so I said, all of us have a little bit of responsibility to be paying attention. You know, I really did. There's one other thing we haven't really touched on, which I'd love to do that is um, how you're committed to indigenous land back stewardship. Can you talk to us a little more, a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think um, it's really important to have a sense of place and understanding to the land and um, the where you are located and what that means in terms of your heritage and history. Um, you know, I am an uninvited guest in Ohlone Ramatush uh, territory. And I think it's really important to understand, you know, the legacy of settler colonialism and the impacts that uh, it is having in today's day. And indigenous communities are extremely vibrant, intelligent, um, and and um, and we all need to be in service of indigenous tribes that are doing the work to um, to to protect and steward the land as they have for millennia. Um, and that goes all across the world um, as well. But in particular, um, you know, being here in, in California and the Bay Area, um, there's 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 a lot that, um, you know, our ecological system here is, um, you know, needs from humans. Humans have a, a relationship to the land. And it's reciprocal. It's a recipro reciprocal relationship, and I think um, you know white settler colonialism um, has really just created this kind of above nature hierarchy. When really we are all um, we are animals within the world of of animals, and so we have a role to play in how we um, give back to the land and how we are contributing. Um, you know, in, in, in a regenerative way. And so, and that is, um, in, and so it's really beautiful to learn about indigenous traditional knowledge, um, traditional ecological knowledge and how um, tribes have, you know, lived on this land in, in a balanced and abundant way um, and had, you know, so, have had, have societies that, um, you know, functioned in 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 ways where nothing was gone to waste, you know, like even in their recipes and their, you know, origin stories, there's a um um a respect for for how um you know plants and animals are are are, are used, you know, for lack of better words. But um and I think that's something that we all need to be you know, in touch with, in touch with um, the the tribes and indigenous communities where you're located, and also like looking on your heritage and trying to unpack the colonialism that may have happened in your homelands as well. You know, um, and getting back to those earth-centered practices where we um, we're just a lot more in tune with the world and listening to you know what our role is and what we are here to do. Um, so yeah, for me, I, I think there's there's a lot of personal work that I, I try to be active about and reflective every day, and I'm still learning and still learning on how to to show up um, in in, um, in in right relationship, um, and uh, and so that's a job for us all to do as well. I, I I totally agree, and I feel exactly the same. I feel exactly the same. Uh, I'm going to I'm Irish. And so now I recently found that out. So I'd like to go visit Ireland 
and um, sometime soon. And in Louisiana, there's lots of uh, indigenous tribes that I'm going to work harder at getting to know. I even know some of these people and I'm, I've am i made it my my decision to get to know them a little better and to, to learn more about their heritage and their histories, which probably goes, it probably goes back thousands of years. So um, I, I don't know in Louisiana, but I know in America they do, um, depending on where, and it's certainly along the coast of California. Um, so we're yes, uh, about out of time, but is there any anything you'd like to add for our listeners? <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. So thank you for hearing me talk um, and and share about other avenues. There's so much history. Um, we are actually celebrating our 50th year anniversary um, this year. And so um, if you stay tuned in October, we'll, we'll probably be having, we're planning for um, a little community block festival on the Great Highway um, near Ocean Beach. So we invite everyone to come, um, to come check us out. And if you want to learn more a little bit about other avenues, there's a great book um, called Other Avenues Are Possible by Shanta um, Nimbark Sakharov, who used to work at other avenues still is around just like our other avenues grandma and um in in, in the most you know respectful of ways she um has contributed a lot to the cooperative movement in san francisco food systems here and so that's a great resource as well um and actually the book that i was kind of referring to some facts earlier that i don't know if it's where to find it maybe i can make it available somehow but it's called The History of Collectivity in the San Francisco Bay Area um, by John Crowell. Well, there's several authors, but John Crowell is the editor. Um, so that's another resource to check out. That's pretty interesting. That's deep. Okay. Now there's one last thing I'd like you to do for us. Pretend you're your mother speaking in, in the, the language she spoke in, and I want to hear you complain about the fish. <laughs> <laughs> in this country there's no fish <laughs> it, it because i i understand a frustration and because there's no substitute there's no substitute right. fish. and it's actually the problem speaking of the theme of this podcast you know um the problem in that we only eat four fish out of the ocean here is um causing mass devastation with um mm -hmm. lots of bycatch waste mm -hmm. and uh just tremendous damage to the ecosystem through these large industrial trawlers that's a whole nother podcast <laughs> um, another, yes we, we could talk we about our fish but um, although what, we are so we, you won't find fish at other avenues, sorry. And for sure, you know, our listeners, we're giving them ideas. They can always find more. I'm going to um, put the names of these books in the in the, uh, in the the podcast, uh, you know, description. And if our listeners want to find out more, they can. Oh, speaking of which, uh, if, if, if suppose someone would like to get in touch with you, how would they do, how would they do that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd happily uh, provide my email. Um, you could also call other avenues, call the store and ask for me, but um, Celia at other avenues dot co-op. C-E-L-I-A. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Celia, for joining me today. Thank you so much, Sandy. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today. We hope you like this episode. Be sure to like, subscribe, and rate the podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, Celia, stay with me. I'm going to stop recording.